Well, we also do want to make sure that all of you have an opportunity to ask the questions. So I'm going to ask Anne and Francis to come up and join us. really shouldn't take any more time. So should we just go right into any questions? Any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Oh, at the very end over there. Is, 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 there, is there a microphone? No, I can see Marie. <laughs> we can hear you. Go ahead. But we're trying to record, so actually, just a yeah, second, just yeah. Hi, hello, thank you very much. Um, this is a question for Francis Morris. We quickly saw the additional building that's being added to the Tate Modern. I wondered if you could quickly expand upon what is going to be exhibited there, and if what is exhibited there is going to become a part of your collection. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, easy answer. Um, the, the principal drive behind having a new building, or the first driver, was that when we built Tate Modern, there's, there's very little back of house space. There's very little space for the kind of educational uh, and additional programs that a museum uh, wants to do and needs to do to engage with its, its audiences and particularly its local communities. But uh, we're also, you know, our collection is expanding and even Tate Modern, as, as we built it in 2000, w was not significantly, uh, wasn't the kind of sea change in terms of size that would ensure us a long-term future. So in terms of the display, or, or in terms of art, the ambition for the new building is the permanent collection. Um, it will allow us to show a broader range uh, of material from the collection and to do it in a number of different ways. And we have some... Uh, the kind of galleries that we haven't had in the old building that might be more suited to smaller items, works on papers, as well as some much more flexible spaces. Um, it's a new build, it's not a conversion, so we can move walls around. And the, uh, what we're working on at the moment is uh, what we'll show and how we'll show it, but uh, that is a secret for now. <laughs> Actually, I think we, this is a question that um, is applicable to the two other museums because both MoMA and Art Gallery of New South Wales have expansion plans, so maybe I can ask both Anne and Swanya to just give two sentences about your expansion plan. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go first. Um, the Art Gallery of New South Wales has wonderful ambitions to expand its bottom line, um, mainly because the collection, you know, less than 5% is on show um, in our gallery and we've been collecting you know c consistently for over a hundred years and it needs room it's it's had series of expansions over its its history but not in any significant way so the footprint is there to move adjacent right right next to it so not um, not a second site somewhere else, like Tate did. Um, and, and there is a site there that we're working on right now. So we're going through an architectural competition. And hopefully by March of 2016, we will have an architect and a design and a development uh, in, in sight, you know, a, a perhaps even a crane like you have. <laughs> And for MoMA, maybe we had a little bit of the opposite uh, phenomenon as Tate Modern. When we built our expansion in, that opened in 2004, what we added a lot of was public spaces like our enormous atrium with restaurants and a shop and a lobby and not as many galleries for <laughs> art as <laughs> might have been. So this new expansion is all 
art galleries. There's not going to be a single cafe. We're putting in bathrooms. Um, <laughs> but other than that, it's, it's really just rooms to put more art in, and, and we badly need it. Right. Any other questions? Oh, there you go. Another question. My question is related to the uh, controversy that was mentioned, and uh, um, Frances uh, Morris also addressed how she embraced controversy. De definitely, there are a lot of positive aspects of controversy, such as PR. But in terms of the negative uh, areas, how do you manage it? Say, for example, like the orange pyramid that's, you know, even locally has catch a lot of attention that take more than is recently shown. It seems like that one of the negative aspects I, you know, a lot uh, people see is the distractions from the main message that the, the artists want to show. Now, like the oranges, people are talking about, um, you know, five pound per orange versus a five dollar for uh, Hong Kong dollars now, that was actually a comment from my uh, domestic helper who has actually read that in a n local newspaper. So certainly there are a lot of attention to it, but it seems like uh, in cases like this, it's more towards the commodity prices of or oranges rather than really the true meaning of, of, of the art piece. Well, uh, we're no st in London, we're no strangers to uh, contra controversy in relation to works of art. And we have uh, Carl Andre's Bricks, which created this huge controversy in the 1960s. And uh, I think it's almost an uh, institutionalized form of controversy that we do put things on display, and the press love to respond, and the public love to respond. And it's entirely healthy. And whenever we do have those kind of controversies, it allows us to return once again to some very basic and fundamental questions about what constitutes art and what constitutes freedom of speech and liberty in a democracy. And they're really important. So, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily court controversy, but when it happens, we, we welcome it and we respond to it. And we certainly don't hide away from it. A Tate ga um, gallery that you have, that you, you, you target so much on the uh, general public, like you mentioned, that you have certain education program uh, when it comes to such um, controversies or, or even uh, interest from the general public that you, you create more interest from them rather than negative uh, perspective that we generated fr from well, those. Well, I should emphasize we don't, we don't set out to create controversies, but I don't think, I think we're quite... We are. We have a. We we we're quite. We welcome risk, and we don't shy away from risk. So that's part of the territory. And I think if we stop make being a risk-taking organisation, we will be poorer for it. And I think maybe s one of the things that we can do. We're a very big institution, and we're quite robust, and we have quite broad shoulders. Our building has broad shoulders, and so you know when we do take take the, the hit, it does enable other institutions, including art in smaller institutions and artists, have a bit more freedom to play if we can be the bad boy. So I think that one of our roles is to, is to take the criticism and is to uh, you know, be, be shouted at and is sometimes to be the underdog. And that's, you know, we, we, I think we're, we're a big enough institution to take that and move on. Thanks. Um, I represent a group of uh, Hong Kong artists. Um, uh, it's been, from the point of art history, it is um, the postmodernism is dead already. So is the world is talking about the artists within the world within the world of artists. They are talking about po post postmodern art. So uh, from the three galleries here, what do you think of the collections about the? Worldwide, in terms of the post postmodern art. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the last part, please? What uh, do we think about post postmodern art? Post postmodern. I think we're going to have to spend about two additional <laughs> hours uh, to <laughs> debate our different definitions. But and do you want to try? <laughs> sure. I, that's the first time hearing that term. Um, but I think that post, speaking in New York maybe, perhaps postmodern has stopped being used, but we didn't, we didn't replace it with post-postmodern, that's new to me. 
And I think everyone's just admitting that um, probably the way we could accurately characterize where we are is late modern, but we're still in modern somehow, I think people feel. We're not on to the next thing, the next absolutely um, new phase of history yet. And it, do I remember it correctly that, I mean, this was before, even before my time, but there was a debate within MoMA whether that name, I mean, this is the burden that you have by having a generic name, right? That whether it should be the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, or even if we stick to, if MoMA sticks to its name, then maybe it should stop at some point. Is that right? <laughs> then my job would get so much easier. <laughs> Well, I think it's, you could kind of ask the question if it's modern with a small M or a capital M. So people might argue that the capital M idea of modern is a particular period of history that will end. But then there's also the small M modern, which is really uh, synonymous with contemporary, yeah. mm -hmm. um, like modern fashion. You know, fashions. Oh, that's a modern dress, um, and I think that that kind of modern is probably um, very unofficially and casually how people think about the museum of modern art or any museum of modern art, and they're not so much thinking as maybe they were hung up more to think about twenty-five years ago some specific period of capital M modern art that is it still on or is it over? Has post-postmodern happened in Australia or the UK? I think we're into the next phase, aren't we? <laughs> post, post, post. No, I, I entirely agree with, um, with Anne. I think, um, I think that we now feel that we, we, c we, c we are still in the modern era. We may be in a late phase. We don't see an end point. I think we're more interested in the idea of multiple moderns than a kind of linear modern that had a beginning and an end. So it's the coexistence of many moderns with many starts and many ruptures but all ongoing and all in dialogue somehow. I agree. I mean, um, also, one of the things that's very clear uh, after our day yesterday is that uh, in different perspectives from different places, different locations, bring a point of view that amplifies that. And that is a really good thing, that we don't all look the same, that we don't all have a muse museums that house the same kinds of things and that the kinds of stories and the art history that's been um, on display really talk about those differences. And if that is what post-postmodern is, that's good. <laughs> and I, maybe I'd like to expand on that just with one anecdote I'll in so far as talking about there isn't one beginning and thereby isn't one end. You know, people think about all the time how the Museum of Modern Art began with this group of painters who I mentioned before, Cezanne, Van Gogh, Seurat, and Gauguin. And people sometimes ask, oh, but didn't modern art really start, for example, with Edward Manet in Paris? Or perhaps didn't modern art really start at the beginning of the 19th century? And, and they, they really ask us to analyze without any doubt, you know, why is it that the beginning of modern art is post-impressionism? And the reason is very simple. At MoMA, in 1920, or in the years leading up to our opening in 1929, in the mid-20s, the Metropolitan Museum of Art up the street collected impressionism. They were good with Renoir and Monet and so on. They stopped before Van Gogh and Cezanne. And so it was purely a kind of accidental happenstance that at that particular moment, the conservative curators at the Metropolitan said no to Cezanne and Van Gogh. So the Museum of Modern Art said, okay, that's where we'll start. But that's it. That's the whole grand logic behind it. But you decided to call it modern and stuck to it for 85 years. Yeah. 
It's, it's about opportunity, isn't it? It's being opportunistic, and that's what Queensland did as well. Yeah. Any other? Oh, there is a question back there. <laughs> Friend on this side. <laughs> This is about the ecologies of mu uh, museums in Asia. So in a, in a recent few, uh, two years, I think there is the appears there's a boom in museum uh, development and also art development in Asia. And uh, the very aggressive Chinese <laughs> museum, it, it was said that it's every week you have a new museum in China. And also I think this is a very progressive Singapore uh, development. And also I think it's relatively very mature uh, mo relatively mature uh, Taiwan uh, cultural center. So what we have now MoMA in, uh, from the US, uh, Tate from New London, and also they're from New South Wales. So what would you expect from M plus in the landscape of museum in Asia? Well, maybe I can begin. Um, there are lots of things that we expect. We have very high expectations. <laughs> but good, a good, good. High degree of confidence as well in the team that can deliver those. But from a personal point of view, and I, I travel uh, quite a lot around the world, particularly in areas that we're undertaking research, and we're beginning to try and get to grips with contexts. And I would, I would, I would look to M Plus to have an insight into the recent history of art in this region and to have a regional perspective, a perspective from Hong Kong on the international art from the times we live in. And I really look, I want that, I don't want M Plus to look anything like Tate Modern, aside from the fact that there are <laughs> marginal similarities in our architecture. Um, <laughs> But I really want, I want, I want the, 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 the walls to speak from the curator's perspective and to tell the stories of the artists who live and work here. It's very hard to add to that, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Except, um, I mean, absolutely, the regional perspective, how you, how you decide to respond to the rest of the world from the lens of Hong Kong, I think that's what we're all wanting to see. And clearly, it's such an energetic region with so much happening. It's, you know, there is huge potential to engage with that and then see how that connection works internationally around the globe. And I, I forgot uh, about Japan. Japan also have very good museum as well. So how, how would uh, M Plus uh, do have a comparative advantage, and also is, is uh, because uh, it seems that uh, the force of the Chinese museum is quite uh, diverse, but this is uh, quite uh, strong. Well, M Plus does have the advantage of Uli Zig's incredible collection, and so they're starting off with this extraordinary resource, and I haven't seen a collection uh, like Uli's in Japan, so that's a you know, simple answer, it's, it's, uh, it's unique. And also, you know, each, each museum is, uh, your audience is your local audience fundamentally. You know, that's what you, that's what you work with immediately. And so, it, you know, m the museums in other parts of the world are working and talking to local audiences. So that's, that's definitely part of what you will do as well as, as much as we do. I think um, uh, we're looking at you. Yeah, <laughs> not, not to, um, this sounds like false flattery and I don't mean it that way at all. <laughs> but, the, but the idea that there have already in these two years been eight one day or two day workshops and evening talks with colleagues from around the world and that, that that will go on till the museum opens already is a sign to me that the people at M Plus are thinking about what is a museum. So it's not only that they're saying, here are the things that other people do, let's go do them. They, they're actually asking themselves the question and asking 
in a very open public way, you know, we, here we have the very kind of rare, to say the least, opportunity to invent something. So if we say we want to do it this way, we can do it this way. And if we say we want to do it that way, we can do it that way. And instead of just doing that, they're really asking lots of questions and doing lots of research and discussing with all sorts of people they may or may not agree with um, or whose situations may or may not be analogous to theirs to get their minds going and, and open their um, themselves and, and their institution to possibilities that in a way we don't have the chance to consider in the same sort of way. And that, if you fulfill that, um, if you keep going in that trajectory and really listen to um, yourselves for what you want, that's, that's something very exciting to us, I think. Perhaps I, uh, maybe there was another side to the question that, um, I mean, I don't know if I completely agree personally um, about the Japan and China developing very strong museum scenes. I think we can certainly say that about Japan having a very long history of institutions, um, but I don't think what our colleagues up here are saying is that you know it is not necessarily a competitive situation that we're going into, but we tap into uh, the network of other colleagues and models um, and sometimes anti-models, but with respect that, uh, and by being plugged into it and being supportive of each other, then you uh, become stronger. Perhaps we have, oh, two hands. <laughs> Hi, uh, just want to thank uh, three speakers to come along to have the talk today, tonight. So I think that throughout the talk uh, for the whole night, I have been very, I think it's quite in encouraging and interesting to see that both three uh, national galleries or museums have been collecting uh, collections from international perspective from like China, India, really like far, far end. So I was wondering how do you find the balance in between for, from collecting from international perspective and from regional perspective? Like, is there any pressures in like the percentage of collection you have? And yeah, thanks. I think collecting is not about percentages. You know, that's not how it, it, it works. Um, it's about what, what works within the institutional context of what already exists. So it's about making those connections more meaningful, um, broadening it, amplifying it. But I have to say in both um, Queensland and at the Argo of New South Wales, the heart of the collection that began those collections are nas national, so they're Australian. And that's the basis of those. The, you know, the international comes in relation to what's, what is a national collection. Maybe I should, from a tape perspective, we certainly don't have a quota or any sense of uh, trying to um, represent the world equally. But the way we are building the collection is really quite sort of holistically from where we already are. So we're really, I mean, I think we just have to recognize that we have a perspective from London. Mm -hmm. And Britain is already in some way marginal to the history, the, the dominant uh, history of uh, modern and contemporary art in 20th century and so we are looking to make contact with artists in our collection make or make visible the context that existed in history between those artists and artists from other parts of the world so it's an evolving situation and that you know it's it evolves as we undertake more research and as scholars in other countries undertake more research and we will learn from the research that M plus does in relation to the history of uh, uh, art in uh, Hong Kong and China. Yeah, and, and um, I think what we all agree with and uh, all our colleagues everywhere agree with is that the most depressing thing is to go far away around the world and to see a museum that looks just like another museum. Like that you could, you know, travel halfway around the world and still um, 
eat at the same restaurant you could eat at across the street from your own house. <laughs> and so for us now, some decades ago, there might have been this kind of aspiration among museums to all rise to some kind of level of international um, equality. And today it's the opposite. I think it's all everybody saying, you know, let's make, let's ask who we are and then who we are as individual institutions and let's bring out that individualism as richly as we can. Uh, thank you. I'm just curious that do you think today the biennial system is challenging the curatorial strategies of museums and what is the difference between the curatorial practice in the museums and in the biennials or triennials? Thank you. Um, I'll start because um, the experience of Queensland is that the triennial sits inside an institution, and that's quite unusual. There are a couple of others. I think the Whitney is one, Fukuoka is another, but they are the exception rather than the rule. Usually a biennial or a triennial sits independently of collecting institutions. And um, what it's done for Queensland was it initiated a collection. So the curatorial impact was that um, the curators from within the institution have been very active in the curating of the, of the triennial to the advantage of the institution in that sense. Um, how that impacts outside, so at the Archive of New South Wales, um, we have the Sydney Biennale since the second Biennale, and the Biennale is Oh, it's coming up to 40 years at the next, the next time it comes up next year. So it's one of the oldest. Um, the Sydney, so seeing it from the other side, if you like, being um, a host, a venue, a partner with the Sydney Biennale, for the Art Gallery of New South Wales, it's a very energizing um, project within its international contemporary programming. So it's every two years, it has a huge injection of what is happening in the world, but it's been curated by a different person each time. That's how the Sydney Biennale works. But a very strong conversation with the gallery's curator and that artistic director. I think, I think it's been, it's had really wonderful iterations and then very, you know, unsuccessful ones as well, but that's that's just what happens with biennales and triennales. And th that's a, a kind of positive example, I think, um, in your case, two really positive <laughs> examples. <laughs> but maybe something you were driving at that uh, that I'll just um, bring up is the definition of a curator. And I think that for curators like us. There's a great deal of work we do that's very behind the scenes and very unglamorous and really devoted um, to the collection and uh, by implication the, the display of the collection, but everything you were hearing for the last two hours, building up this, this, whole, this holding, which really is the identity of the museum. And over these last 20 years, there's become the popular conception of the curator as somebody who makes a show and goes away, who comes somewhere, you know, does the spectacular thing and exits. And for us, it's a very different model. It's, it's, we've all been at the places we've worked, well, you're new now, but you were, tw you know, nearly 20 years where you were, same in these cases, that it's a very slow process in a way to begin to understand a collection, begin to understand the community for whom you're making that collection, the community who's helping you finance that collection. It's a very, very, very different definition of curator. And the curator of a biennial and the curator of a classic gallery or museum, you know, have certain points of overlap, but many different kind of things. And I think there is 
perhaps it's fair to say, uh, speak for myself, not the three of us, a kind of irritation with many young people Who, who, who don't understand the, the museum side of being a curator because that isn't the visible side of curating at this moment. The biennial side is the more visible one. And I was going to also add to that, I, just <laughs> quickly, is that collecting, collect, collection making is very slow. It takes time. You don't really see anything for at least 10 or 15 years. No, and people actually, you know, we have to acknowledge all the time that we will be dead, <laughs> literally, before it's known how good a job we did. We will be posthumously renowned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose I wanted to add one thing which is less about the curator and more about the art. I always think of biennials, and I actually I really love visiting biennials, and you get this intense engagement with somebody's vision, but often the art, artist vision is to the fore, at least as much as the curators. But uh, biennials are always a, a snapshot. It's you know one curator or maybe a, a few in dialogue with a, a group of artists, and that's just so. It's just one particular sp perspective on those works of art. The wonderful thing about collections is that once the, once works are in the collection, then then numerous individuals have access access to them. Whether it's the conservators doing their scientific research, whether it's the education curators doing their public programs, whether it's junior curators learning their art history, whether it's senior curators making displays and exhibitions, and then of course they are accessible. Uh, and on loan to numerous institutions around the world. So it's not, a, it's not a single snapshot, it's multiple views onto that work. And that's really the, 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 the fundamental difference between the work of art in a biennial and a, and a, and a museum. And the, the latter is so much more rewarding. And as you say, it's a lifetime. Slow release. Yeah. Slow release. Slow release. It seems like all of you are willing to stick around further, but I'm getting a signal that we have to get off the stage, so I'm gonna just take one final question over there. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking that even though M Plus has the wonderful collection, but it doesn't have a facility, whereas of course the other respective uh, speakers tonight uh, do have facilities with long and uh, rich um, collections and also long and rich um, exhibitions and histories of display. And so in thinking about the way in which um, artists are continuing to uh, make work that is increasingly ephemeral with performance work, with social practice, with um, um, things and other such related work, how in your, and, and also in, for example, with um, Francis was speaking about, the con there's a certain continuity with the same architect building the Tate uh, in its initial phase, and let's say in its expanded phase. So in the added wrinkle, I would say, with um, not only the way in which um, artwork is moving, but the way in which technology, for example, is influence of the way in which uh, art itself is circulating, images of art, et cetera, education, um, just, I, I remember the moment when the MoMA allowed people to take photographs again within the galleries, for example. How has all of these things, um, thinking about the, the way in which these expansions of these buildings are gonna happen, um, influenced um, not display strategies today, but you're thinking about showing this work in maybe th your display strategies of tomorrow? Is a question for me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's for all of you. I mean, you're all building expanded facilities, but the way in which these facilities are going to house the work and the way in which the work is going to exist um, is, you, I'm just wondering if you thought about um, sort of uh, how, how you're going to show these show them in these new facilities? Or is that maybe for the architect? I don't know. Well, you know, now that we're, um, we've got the cranes there and <laughs> digging the hole, maybe we should really start thinking about um, how the 
display should be. No, I'm, I'm sort of uh, being facetious, but really I think uh, as I alluded to, uh, to it in the beginning that, you know, we have been, this institution has been collecting just about two years plus. So, I mean, not to just pat ourselves on the back, but I think it is incredible to think that the collection is already over 4,000 objects. And then I really meant it when we said that, you know, compared to these three collections, it's really a fraction, but we are, when we have our very expansive building, we're going to have the exactly same problem, maybe of different kinds and degrees, that we're going to be able to show only a fraction of that, of what we have, whatever the final number of the collection will be at the time that it opens. Of course, there's no final number because the whole idea of permanent collection is that it continues to grow. Um, but, you know, so I think uh, we are in this stage of dreaming, as uh, Anne said, but I, at least for myself, that um, it shouldn't be just irresponsible dreaming, right? That we have to rigorously study um, what these museums have been doing for many years because, you know, I'm sort of of the school that all good ideas that you think that you, came, you think that you came up with that are so brilliant um, and that you wake up in the middle of the night and they think that, oh my God, I'm a genius. But then all these ideas actually, historically looking back, turned out to have been all tried in many ways. You know, so I think it is really important to push yourself to be innovative, but also, I guess, kind of humble. I think you become more and more humble the more you know different histories. I think it is also though worth thinking when you're looking ahead and thinking about how you're going to you know, decide what you're going to do, where you're going to do it and how you're going to do it. That there are, you know, in, in addressing, the, there's so many models of great practice, but maybe it's worth looking at some of the things that don't work in contemporary museums. And one of the things that I think we're all aware of is just how much work we have in deep storage. And we're all aware that some of those holdings aren't the most interesting things in the world, but many of our visitors would love access to that material and whether there's a way of rethinking access to the store. And I think the solution that Schaulager um, has in uh, Basel is, is wonderful, although it's by appointment that they have sort of open, works beautifully installed in a slightly different way in intent, deep, uh, intense storage facilities. So I think there are some, I would love to see when I come to your opening, something that I've, you know, a solution to something that's always been a problem for me and I've never seen the, I've never seen the solution to it. Make some notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I may be misinterpreting your question slightly, but also I think um, just to say that this comes up for MoMA often um, now with the discussion of the new galleries. You know, and in the end, we make a mistake to put too much emphasis on the look of the galleries because if the programming is excellent, the program is ex it will be excellent. And when you think of all the great work, for example, of contemporary artists that takes place in Beaux-Arts buildings that are 150 years old, and when you think of um, all of the kind of creative work that takes place, say, by performance artists in spaces that were built for paintings. It, it's great that M Plus will be working with great architects and thinking hard about how to come up with flexible spaces, varied spaces, spaces in which architecture doesn't get in the way, just to name three quickly. But in the end, what's going to get people there and, and what's going to um, keep people coming back is how, what kind of things happen with what kind of art in that space. Gloria, uh, may I yeah. add a little bit to this? Thank you. Uh, because I think that we, we, we do talk a lot about the building because the cranes are there, but I also I think it, in this question was also, of course, the awareness that actually, I mean, we build buildings because we still think that there are, there is a need for those kinds of spaces. But we're also totally aware of that there is a need for other spaces. I mean, you're driving, the big construction that starts next year, which is Digital M Plus, for example, which is a parallel building in a sense, a parallel platform, which is, of course, will do other things and will house other things. 
and we're building within the building a moving image center, which is, uh, I think, thinks differently about displays of moving image and tries to sort of expand the idea of what the museum as we know is. I mean, a central mantra to what we do in, in M plus is really that we always remind ourselves that the museum is not the same as the building. We really, the museum is really a relationship between a content and its audiences and the building is a tool for that relationship, a very important tool still and we believe that it's there because there are lots of practitioners, artists, designers and so forth who actually like to see their things in the buildings but it's not the only thing we do and I think that well, and of course the whole archive question, the whole uh, digitalization question is, is there and is alive and something we think very actively about. I think we sort of landed a little bit too much perhaps in the sort of talking about buildings now because they are by tradition our focus in a sense. They are often mixed up with the museum. This was not a closing remark but I, I it was important to have it said. Uh, but I, I think, think that's a nice closing remark. So. Uh, <laughs> We're glad the architects aren't here tonight. Thank you for coming and I think we just want to thank Dorian and Lars and all their colleagues at M Plus for having us. It was really an honor to be here on this occasion.